Oh, shell shock. Here at STG, we're all big fans of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise, going all the way back to the 80s, from the grungy, blood-soaked black-and-white comics, to the toy-slinging cartoon, to the improbably great 1990 film, to 2018's Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which has a new movie out on Netflix. It rocks. You should watch it. It's hard to explain if you weren't there. Back then, they hadn't invented smartphones and tablets yet. They had only just barely invented video games. So children of the dystopian 80s, having no outside to play in anymore due to industrialization and the satanic panic, were forced to play with expensive pieces of plastic based on cartoon characters. And the turtles were the biggest expensive pieces of plastic of all time. This was the absolute zenith of kids' toy culture. From the late 80s to the early 90s, these four turtle boys were bigger than the Beatles. They were bigger than Jesus. Hell, they were bigger than Garfield. Action figures, plushies, multiple comic book series, cartoons, video games, countless alternate action figures, playsets, lunchboxes, bed sheets, t-shirts, keychains, Star Trek crossover action figures, and one very cringy action figure of Leonardo cosplaying a Native American. Nothing is ever likely to reach the heights of popularity the Turtles saw back then, but right now may just be the second best time to be a Turtles fan. In addition to still making tons of quality material, the gods of vertically integrated franchise marketing have seen fit to grace their undeserving consumers with the Cowabunga Collection, a comprehensive compilation of some of the most notable Turtle games of the era, as well as Shredder's Revenge, a whole new game in the style of Turtles in Time, but with the benefit of about 30 years of beat-em-up gameplay evolution. Is Cowabunga worth buying? Is Shredder's Revenge a worthy follow-up? This is Patchy with Square Table Gaming. I do all the art here, I made that little intro to this video, and my wife and I stream games on Friday, so come by and say hi. While you're here, hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't, click the bell. It helps us out a lot with the algorithm, I'm told. And I've heard it can feel good. Click the bell. Click the bell. Click the bell. Click the bell. The Cowabunga Collection compiles multiple versions of different TMNT games from 1989 to 1993, based on the 1987 cartoon. Basically, unless you were a massive fan of the Amiga and DOS games, everything is here, preserved in its original form with lots of optional enhancements. Starting off the collection, we have what was probably your first TMNT game if you're my age. <laughs> I think most of us agree this one wasn't good, but it is a bit unfairly maligned. They basically didn't know how to make video games yet. I mean, for an NES game, it looks pretty good. It's repetitive as shell, but again, the NES game. This is the part everyone remembers because it sucked. You have to swim past these electrical pylons to disarm these bombs across separate screens, and you're on a time limit. You are given very little indication of where anything is. It's just... Shell! God! Shell! shell Mother! Shell! Er with the help of the rewind feature, I got through it without too much trouble this time. It's been said a lot, but this sort of thing was pretty common in NES games. You could only fit so much stuff on a cart, so the idea was to make you play an unreasonable amount of times to get good at it. That and a certain arcade design ethos that got into a lot of early console games. I feel like this game gets crapped on a lot because we remember it being hard, but NES games in general were extremely frustrating. And the game isn't really good, but worth playing to completion with enhancements. It's better than you remember. What the shell? hell are some of these enemies, though? Dig these flame effects. Dig that old pixel crunch. Love that carpet gradient. Look at that. It's like three colors. They get all that out of three colors. That's so cool. So yeah, this was the first Turtles arcade game. It's emblematic of the era. You've got two buttons, you can't sprint, pretty limited move set. April is a helpless damsel who stands there, gets kidnapped. Wait, did you see that? Go back. That's... D did everyone already know about this and I'm just now finding out? There's not a lot of things that that could be. Guys, I think April burned down her apartment getting high and blamed it on Bebop and Rocksteady? <laughs> From what I understand, this being four players was a pretty big deal in its day. Personally, I was a big fan of Turtles in Time and Hyperstone Heist. This one frustrated me then, and it still does now. Of course, now I can just... <laughs> Impressively recreated. I mean, even the cutscenes look nice. Weirdly, I feel like this version just feels a bit better to play than the real arcade version here. 
This is probably true of console ports of arcade games in general, because consoles didn't want your quarters. I am unreasonably amused by the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, sewer-dwelling mutant outcasts, opening this game vacationing on a Florida beach. I think stuff like this confused us as kids more than we realized, made it look like they only lived in a sewer because the sewer was like a cool place to be. Also, was Shredder on vacation too? What are they doing? Oh, uh, well, evidently he wasn't. Well, it's more TMNT NES Arcade. Listen, if you like TMNT NES Arcade, here's more of it. The Doom 2 of Turtles beat-em-ups. It's funny how much you get to see the turtles just wandering the streets in these games. The old show, too. You know, there's a reason they stay underground and only come out at night. They're giant turtles. They freak people out. Plus, the police would be after them. Not for being mutants or vigilantes, but for being homeless people. It's a Game Boy game. Some real nice art for a Game Boy game. I like these Mausers. Love that parallax scrolling grayscale city back there. Very nice. Yep. Love how it's a Game Boy game, so the boys all look the same on the character select there. Not enough memory in that little cart. These animations are actually quite a bit rougher than Fall of the Foot Clan. You see how Leo doesn't really move when he swings? Also, that kick is really funny looking. Very stiff. Just sort of throws his leg out in front of him. Doesn't move any other part of his body. Very unnatural. I wouldn't kick like that. I was just, that was some somersault, though. That looked awesome. What the? Shell. For being like three frames, that was a really nice little jump roll. I guess the Kicks and Swings guy was on break that day. The day that they made this. I believe it took a day. I don't know, it's a Game Boy game. Even the really good Game Boy games are Game Boy games. No disrespect. This one is kind of interesting. It's a Turtles Game Boy game with kind of Metroid 2 vibes. You start as Michelangelo, you're looking for your brothers. Each brother you get, you get access to different weapons. Sort of equivalent to upgrades. Pretty cool! Frustrating, though, and repetitive. Didn't get very far. I love how much Shredder talks to these guys through the TV. It happens constantly. Everyone in New York must feel insane. Uh, I'm not good at fighting games. I mean, sorry, but wait, look at this. Do you want me reviewing these? Oh, shell! What would I even do? What? Ugh. I'm not qualified to tell you if these are good or not. I'll say this. I love these old sprites. There's beautiful stuff in here, and it's cool that every version of this game is completely different from every other version of this game. William S. Sessions. Who is that? Well, whoever he is, he's racist! Here we go. This is the pinnacle. Not just the best Turtles arcade game, but one of the best arcade games of the era. I mean, look at how cool this looks. Bloated beanbag? This was the best the Turtles had ever looked, and the game was packed with faithful renditions of series villains. It wasn't just that they looked great. Look at Baxter Stockman here. That's awesome. Voice acting here was on point. Audio quality really nice. You can now run by tapping in a direction twice which really hypercharges the pacing compared to any of its predecessors on consoles or in arcades. Most of these games are more interesting to me than they are good. If I'm going to be playing any of them seriously, it's going to be Turtles in Time. What else can you say? It's a masterpiece of its form. This version of Turtles in Time had to suffer a graphics downgrade. Visually, it isn't as crisp, and a lot of that impressive audio is gone. Unfortunately, there's only so much you could fit on a Super Nintendo card which is what I would be saying if they hadn't added new bosses, new animations, time trial versus modes, tightened up the controls, and used the Super Nintendo's Mode 7 capabilities to add depth to backgrounds and throws. Turtles in Time on the Super Nintendo is essentially the Turtles in Time director's cut. When I was recording footage for these and I wanted to really have fun, I'd almost always jump to this one. Despite its minor drawbacks, it's just a better game, and there's more of it. One enhancement I'd have liked to see for this one is a four-player co-op mode, so we could play the superior version with as many players as the arcade version. But at that point, you're probably making changes to the game's code and assets, and those kind of resources would be better placed into a full remaster, which included everything and ran in widescreen at 60 FPS. Hey, someone should do that. Hyperstone Heist is interesting in that it feels like what you'd get if Turtles in Time were released today and then a fan created a mod with different levels, slightly different art, new sound effects, and so forth. 
It has less levels, but there are other aspects of it that are tuned up or tweaked. Throwing enemies at the screen is gone, but everything feels extra punchy. I'm especially fond of this ridiculous art style used in the cutscenes. Look at Shredder's muscles here. Look at this art. Look at this absolute unit. How many abs does he have? That is too many. It's not as good as Turtles in Time, it's nowhere near as artistically varied, and it simply doesn't feel as good to play. Due to its being on the Genesis while most of the notable Turtles games were on Nintendo systems, you may have missed this one. And though it doesn't beat out the all-time masterpiece of Turtles beat-em-ups, it's more than worth a look. I especially like that Sega Genesis sound design. Listen to how gritty some of these sound effects are. The Calabunga Collection is a gold standard of games preservation, the ideal scenario for packing a bunch of old ROMs into a game and selling it for 40 bucks. If that sounds like a ripoff, well, here's the thing. The first thing I checked up on, as I do with any collection of old games, was the extras. I'm always curious to see what was considered historically significant enough to include. It's also, I think, a good gauge of how much developers cared. So let's just take a look and, um... Oh, oh, oh my god, oh my god, look at this! We've got all of the old instruction manuals, advertising, original Turtles designs, style guides, comic book covers, music tracks from all the games, audio samples, I mean, I'm not even going to look at half of this stuff. Are these original design documents for the old NES game? Wait, they have this for all of them! There's hundreds of pages of this stuff! It isn't just great that they have these documents. A good compilation should be a museum of old games, one which deepens your understanding of their creation and makes you appreciate them on a new level. You can really see that even with something like a licensed NES game from a Konami shell company, there were real artists behind the scenes making it all come together. These documents practically have their fingerprints all over them. It's so cool that they're included here. All this context, all this history, you'll never find all of this anywhere else, and this alone makes the collection a tremendously impressive archive of these games. Okay, so how did they do with the games? Not only are all the games here, we have multiple versions of each game. Console ports in the old days were interesting, because due to the capabilities of different systems, often ports of the same game with the same title would really be completely different games from one another. A low effort version of this type of collection would have one of each version of these games. This one has everything. You can even switch to the Japanese region versions of each of them, which I didn't even have time to check up on what that does, but it's good that it's in there. In addition to all of this, every game has unique built-in enhancements like cheats, challenge modes, alternate control modes, extra lives, some surprisingly decent CRT filters, aspect ratio options, save states, and rewinds. Personally, I really like the CRT filter, and I used it for a lot of this footage. The NES games even have optional hacks to fix the frame drops that were present on original hardware. It's not just significant that it's there, but that it's optional. You can play these games exactly as they were, or you can customize your experience. Which brings me to the best possible thing that I can say about the Cowabunga Collection. This isn't just good games preservation best practices, it's not just a quality product, but it's a better, more convenient product than you could get on your own. If you're a big old school TMNT fan and you want to play everything, the Cowabunga Collection is the best place to do it. And for a second, let's talk about what it's not. It's not greedy. It's not cynical. You know, for an IP that was in many ways ground zero for the marketing nightmare dystopia we live in today, in today's market, this collection feels downright humble. No, you will not be asked to pay to win. You will not have features gated off by microtransactions. There aren't even any alternate skins you can buy or any of that. You buy it once, you get everything, just as you remember it, and then some. If you love TMNT, if you love these games, pick up this collection. It is definitively the best way to play them. Sadly, nearing the end of TMNT's glory days, we stopped getting games like this. The Turtles, and ultimately the arcades, and to a large extent the side-scrolling beat-em-up genre in general, were all on their way out. Thirty years after the release of Turtles in Time, in the year of our Lord and Savior 2022, Shredder's Revenge drops us back into the 1987 series. The style and aesthetics are familiar, the colors are vibrant, the pixels are nice and crunchy, but something's different. Actually, everything is different. 
With the technological and economical limitations of arcades now out of the way, Shredder's Revenge aims not just to be a nostalgic follow-up to Turtles in Time, but a modern console 2D beat-em-up, bringing a level of depth not possible in the old days. It's not quite the way it was, but it aims to be the way you remember it. The number of possible players is now expanded to six, and we get three new characters on the roster. Master Splinter, April O'Neil, and, after you beat the game, Casey Jones, everyone's favorite reactionary psycho. This guy would definitely crack your head open if he caught you filming the police, let's be honest. All have pretty varied movesets, the Turtles included, with differences in speed, reach, strength, and the power of their special moves. This time around, we've got a lot more combos available to us, and I appreciate that they have a section set aside to explain it all. I needed this, actually. One cool thing about the combat this time around is you can keep whacking guys as long as they don't hit the floor, so you're incentivized to string your combos as long as possible to build up your special attack gauge. Special attacks in the old games meant sacrificing a bit of health. You wanted to do the cool move, Konami wanted you to keep putting quarters in the machine, and you had a tiny child brain, so you did it. We're adults now, we're grown, we're sophisticated, and dopamine hits are harder to come by. The special attack gauge is one of those great, simple little video game feedback loops. Keep doing combos, keep getting special attacks. You can also get attack gauges by getting off a taunt now and then. Doing better also levels up your character. Oh yes, this beat-em-up has an RPG element, granting you access to more life bars, more attack gauges, and flying special attacks. And all of this, again, means different movesets per character, different attack animations, different taunts. You're not playing as four of the same guy reskinned with better or worse reaching weapons. All seven characters each bring their own unique ways of tackling the game. April is especially fun to play. She's fast as hell. Her kick goes straight up. Her attack animations are really solid. The developers based her fighting style on Cynthia Rothrock and the Magic Crystal. I heard some chuds were trying to manufacture their usual controversy around April being playable, too tough and not hot enough, but one, shut up, two, shut up, and three, yeah, no, they were the correct amount of horny when they made this. Casey's a blast too, it's nice they made him an unlockable, because even at base level, he's a beast. With all of this and 16 lovingly handcrafted levels, plus a different ending per character, replay value is off the charts. Each level has a few different challenges and collectibles, encouraging you to run through them a few more times with each of your characters. Speaking of the levels, you're going to want to be looking at them a lot more than once. Levels in Turtles in Time were stunning in their day, but occasionally became sparse and repetitive. But look at the way this level opens here. That's just solid 2D animation right there. And that's a totally unique piece of pixel work you'll be looking at for like 20 seconds before moving on. I especially love the way they recreated 1980s Coney Island here. The developers took inspiration from The Warriors and Streets of Fire, the two movies that most influenced the beat-em-up genre in the first place. The 1987 cartoon and arcade games were set in New York, yet rarely grounded themselves with real-life landmarks. Aside from the Statue of Liberty, New York was just a random cartoon city. Again, this is TMNT the way you remember it, not the way it was. Speaking of the pixel art, we gotta take a moment to highlight the pixel art because it is incredible. One of the thrills of the original TMNT arcade games was how much they felt like playing the cartoon. Everyone and everything looked, felt, and moved just right. Shredder's Revenge pushes it even further. There are many more in-between frames and extreme poses, and legitimate traditional animation techniques. They also each feel like themselves, like they move and behave the way you remember them, especially the taunts. You can tell a lot of love for the Turtles went into this. Even this intro, well, the 1987 intro is a classic, and I don't think this quite captures its energy, pacing, and on-the-nose cheesiness. But oh my god, the animation here is on point. Our boys have never looked better. Look at how badass Splinter is. The game is perfectly great in single player, and that's how I spent most of my time with it, but the utter chaos of co-op is a true thing of beauty. It's nice to see a couch co-op game. Can't imagine what it's like with six people. How would you see anything? So are these games a buy or a bust? Well, obviously they're both a buy. You can bust on your own time, buddy. Easy to pick up, hard to master. Shredder's Revenge is a reverent and nostalgic take on 80s TMNT and its arcade classics that nonetheless resist getting mired in the genre's arcade limitations, delivering a tight, satisfying, and infinitely replayable old-school, new-school beat-em-up experience. We had a blast with this one, and for my part, 
It sent me down a rabbit hole that resulted in me buying a bunch of old Turtles comics and watching all the old movies and shows. I have absorbed as much Turtles content this month as I did when I was six. You know, I haven't played beat em ups in forever since getting into these. Should probably try out that Streets of Rage 4 at some point. Anyway, this is Pat G with STG signing off. Oh, shell shock.